if you are lonely when you feel afraid you're not the only we are all the same in need of mercy to be forgiven and be free it's all you got to lean on but thank god it's all you need and all the people said amen Whoa. Well, it don't matter. We are strong. You know, love is what we're after. We're all broken, but we're all in this together. God knows we stumble and fall. And He so loved the world, He sent His Son to save us all. And all the people said, is the kingdom, the kingdom of God, and all the people said amen, whoa, and all the people said amen, give thanks to the Lord for his love never ends, and all the people said amen, and all the people said amen, whoa, 
glory. Show us, show us your power. Show us, show us your glory, Lord. Just sing that again. Show us. Show us, show us your glory. Show us, show us your power. Show us, show us your glory, Lord. Open up the heavens, we want to see you. Open up the floodgates, a mighty river flowing from your heart. Open up the floodgates, a mighty river flowing from your heart, filling every part of our Some days, things don't work out like they're supposed to. But I'd never stopped this before. Let's worship Him. Everyone needs compassion. Love that's never failing, let mercy fall on me. And everyone needs forgiveness, the kindness of a Savior, the hope of nations. Savior, He can move the mountains. My God is mighty. He is mighty to save forever, author of salvation. And he rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. Take me as you find me. All my fears and failures fill my life again. I give my life to follow everything I believe in. Now I surrender. I surrender. Savior, He can move the mountains. My God is my he is mighty to save forever, author of salvation. He rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. So shine your light and let the whole world see. We're singing for the glory of the risen King. Jesus, shine your light and let the whole world see. We're singing for the glory of the risen King. Savior, He can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever. Author of salvation. He rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. this line again. Take me as you find me. Take me as you find me. All my fears and failures and fill my life again. I give my life to follow everything I believe in. 
never fails, it never gives up, it never runs out on me. Your love never fails, it never gives up, it never runs out on me. Your love never fails, it never gives up, it never runs out on me. Your love, your love. God, we just thank you so much for that love this morning. God, we thank you that uh, no matter what's going on around us, Lord, that no matter where we are, God, when things aren't perfect, God, when things aren't going our way, God, when there's sickness around us, when there's trouble around us, God, when there are uh, just so many things, God, that fight for our attention, God, we want to let you know that we remember you. God, we know you're with us. We know that your love doesn't fail us. And God, we celebrate that today. God, I pray you just speak to us, God, to the hearts that are hurting this morning. God, that you would just touch them. God, for those this morning who are here, God, with joy in their hearts. God, we just want to ask you to encourage them further. God, just to continue to stir that up. God, we pray you speak to us now, Lord, as we open your word. God, let us hide it in our heart so that we don't sin against you. We thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. Uh, this morning, before we get into the, uh, the sermon text, uh, the scripture and the sermon this morning, we've got a couple of announcements that we want to make real quick. Uh, if, you've, if you've read your bulletin, then you know that, uh, well, I, before we get there, let me say that Wednesday nights, let me invite you, we're, we're going through uh, the Bible study over in the sanctuary, it starts about 6.15 each Wednesday night about Samson, and uh, I would encourage you if you've, uh, uh, to come out and be a part of that. It's a great story, uh, it's a great character, there's a lot that we can learn from who Samson is, and so let me announce that. Uh, secondly, if you've read your bulletin, then you know the next Sunday night we're having a meal here in the Family Life Center for Eric and Kimberly and their family. This, uh, this is the last month that they'll be with us. They're uh, moving on to, uh, to other things right now to, answer, uh, uh, to continue to answer the call that God has placed on their life. And, uh, you know, and Eric uh, has a, feels a call to pastor, which I completely are, uh, am in 100% agreement with, and uh, for him and Kimberly, and and Eric has uh, his credentials in the Assembly of God, and so we strongly encourage that where that time has spent and that groundwork's been laid, that obviously that's the direction God's calling, and so he's going to be taking a, a, an associate position at Muscle Shoals First Assembly of God. Isn't that right, Eric? And, uh, and so from there, uh, the next step, whenever God puts it there, will be as a, as a senior pastor in a church somewhere, and so this is their last month with us. They've done a great job with us. They've, uh, they've, they've done a fantastic job with the, with the youth. They've been a, a great example for the kids to watch and, and to see and to, uh, you know, for our, our younger kids who were coming out of the children's department when they came along to transition them into to youth ministry. And uh, uh, they, they, they've done a great job. We've been blessed by them. We're thankful for them. We appreciate their, uh, their service and their commitment here at Pleasant Hill and for their continued commitment uh, for the kingdom of God. So next Sunday night, we're going to have a meal here uh, at 6 o'clock. Evelyn's going to provide the meat for us, so we're asking everybody to bring a side dish. And uh, we're going to take that time let them know how much we appreciate the, the, the work they've done and the effort that they've put in. And, uh, and so you, you plan to be here next Sunday night at 6 o'clock. Bring a dish, and we'll let them know that we love them, that we appreciate them, and that we'll be praying for them because it is a, these are hard decisions to make. These are tough steps to make. Uh, it's one thing with... With, with uh, a husband and wife making these steps. It's, it's another thing with a husband and wife and kids making these steps. So, uh, so I know they've prayed about it, and I know they've sought God's leadership over it and God's guidance over it. So uh, uh, we, we strongly believe that this is the direction that God's calling them. So for that, we're gonna, next Sunday night, we're going to celebrate that and be thankful for what they've done and for what's ahead of them. So, so plan to be here next Sunday night at 6 o'clock, and we're going to have a meal together. Uh, this morning, the sermon, sermon title is uh, Created in Christ Jesus for Good Works. And that within itself is a, <clears throat> is a quote out of one of the passages that I'm going to read here shortly. You know, what seems to be in the forefront of all the discussions right now is the gay marriage issue in the state of Alabama, how, uh, you know, through a federal judge has declared that it's uh, necessary or legal now in the state of, Al state of Alabama for... 
uh, same-sex couples to get married. We got a letter this week, or last week, uh, from the bishop of uh, North Alabama United Methodist Church, just reaffirming uh, within the United Methodist Church and the, with the polity and the doctrine of the Methodist Church um, that although the state of Alabama has deemed it legal, that it, it's still against the doctrine of the Methodist Church of what we believe and what we practice and what clergy are, uh, what clergy are free to do or free to perform. And, and just reminded us that, uh, that although the state's declared it legal, you, you still can't do it or participate in it. So, uh, obviously, uh, there's a lot of leaders within our state that needs a lot of prayer about the decisions that they're having to make right now. And there are a lot of hard decisions. There are a lot of tough decisions. And it's brought up a lot of conversation about what's right and about what's wrong and about assumptions that are being made and so forth and so on. And so this morning, we're going to take just a little bit of time and we're going to talk about this. And I want you to understand that, you know, we talk about this, uh, we're going to talk about it the way of which they've talked about it in the New Testament is what we're going to do this morning. And, it, and it's a much bigger issue than one issue. Understand that. I mean, for, for the writers of the New Testament to address, be it sexual immorality from a heterosexual standpoint or from a homosexual standpoint, it was always a bigger issue than that, the issue within itself. In order for them to address that, they would, they would not just talk about the particular issue within itself, but they would also lay a lot of groundwork about the condition of humanity within itself and the desires that are born from the heart of broken men and women. The, the desires that are born from within the heart of, of who we are, what we are, what's been passed on to us from one generation to the next, to the next, to the next. And stuff I've passed on to my kids and stuff that my parents passed on to me and they're going to pass on theirs and uh, to their kids and to my grandkids and... And so they would talk about the condition of man's heart before they would really start addressing particular issues. And so what we're going to do this morning is we're going to look at a couple of passages in the New Testament. We're going to do a little exegetical work with some of these scripture. And we're going to look at what Paul is saying to church in Ephesus and to the, to the believers in Rome that had recently come to know Christ. You know, and at that particular time, Rome considered itself to be kind of the bleeding edge of culture in a lot of ways. Uh, you know, it... it champion the fact that they were enlightened and, uh, and were well-educated and had greater insight than the rest of the world as though they thought. And so when people in that particular town within that culture come to know Christ, they brought all of that stuff with them and, and, and the learning and uh, the assumptions that have been made. And so Paul begins to address that in Rome, uh, in Romans. And so we're going to talk about that in a minute. But we're going to start off with Ephesians here, and I want you to listen to what Paul says. And well, the way that's going to work is I'm going to read you a, a slide here from Ephesians chapter two, and then after I read this, we're going to go to Rome, uh, to the book of book of Romans, and we're going to read about 16 passages there. Then we're going to come back to Ephesians to finish up this passage, because I want you to listen and pay close attention to what Paul is saying, because there's some very key words in all of these passages that we really need to pay attention to and hear what he's saying. Listen to this: Ephesians chapter two, verse one through two. 1 through 3. It says, In you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince uh, of power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath just as the others. Now before we go to Rome, and he really begins to explain uh, what a lot of this is about. There's three particular areas in this passage that I want you to pay special attention to. Number one, Paul identifies the fact that, uh, you know, he takes this journey with them and he tells them that, that Christ has made you alive, you were dead in your trespasses, you were given over to, and he gives us a description of Satan as the prince of power of this air, so forth and so on, and, and about the spirit that was working in the sons of disobedience. And then in verse 3, I want you to listen, and in verse 3 is where we find three particular phrases that I want us to pay special attention to. He says, among whom also we all conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath just as the others. Now what we're going to do is we're going to identify in just a minute what it is that Paul is talking about when he says children of wrath. Because all through the New Testament, you find phrases like power of God and you find phrases like wrath of God 
and a lot of times they're very close together. Most of the time they're very close together. Well, in this particular time, Paul is telling them that we, like you, were once given over to these sinful desires of our heart. We were once given over to these things, whatever it was. And what he says in this is that we conducted ourselves, we did what the desires of our flesh wanted to do, and we fulfilled the desires of our flesh. When he was in a state away from Christ, the desires of the flesh, he conducted himself according to, and he fulfilled those desires, whatever those desires might be. So what he does very early on as he begins to talk about this is he establishes the fact that we all, we all, outside of Christ, have been in that place of where we were all prisoners and we were all slaves to the desires and to the lust of our flesh. And that's why he describes himself as the children of wrath. And we'll talk about that more in, Rome, uh, in the book of Romans here in just a minute. But he says, before Christ, there was a time when we all, every one of us, so Paul identifies the fact that within the heart of every individual is born this weakness to follow the desires of the flesh. Within the heart of every individual. He says, all of us, all of us, outside of Christ, once conducted ourselves according to the desires and to the lust of the flesh. We didn't just have them, but we, we planned our life according to them. You know, we didn't just have these desires. We didn't just have these particular lusts within our minds and within our hearts and within our flesh. We fulfilled them. I mean, we, we fulfilled them. We were completely given over to them. We were prisoners of these things. And they, they were stronger than we were. And we were, we were all given to them at one time or another. But He that has made us alive, and He has done all these wonderful things for us. If you continue reading on in Ephesians, which we will shortly, if you can, uh, He's done all these wonderful things for us. He's done all these great things for us. And He's resurrected us to be something good. Where at one time, it doesn't matter what the desire was, or what the lust, particular lust might have been, or still was, at one time, they all were given over to it. Because we're powerless against it. We're powerless against it. That's why we're slaves to sin. That's why we're dead in our sins. That's why we're dead in our trespasses. That's why there's no good thing that you and I could ever do that would be good enough to get us into the presence of the Father to declare us to be righteous, because we are completely weak to these desires of the flesh and the lusts of the flesh. And when we talk about it within the context that we're talking about, let's, let's not get confused in the fact that it's the things that we decide to be that are big, bad, and ugly, or it's the things that are small and white lies and, and, and simple things that everybody does and it's no big deal. He's talking about all the desires, all the lusts of the flesh, that outside of Christ we were all given to it. So within the heart of every man, regardless of where they come from or what's going on in their life or where they're at, because of the fall in the Garden of Eden, within the heart of every man is born these desires that create unrighteousness. Within the heart of every man is born this. And let me tell you, none of us, regardless of what the desire is or what the lust is, can ever take the stance that we were born a particular way so we're free to fulfill those desires. Because let me tell you, I've got my weaknesses, and let me, let me say that I didn't pick them. I didn't pick them. I didn't get a decision to be made. Even if I learned them through a conditional manner of being raised at home as a four-year-old boy with mama and daddy who one was in church and one was out of church, and this stuff was, was taught to me, do you know at five years old, I still didn't get a choice in this matter. I didn't get a choice in this matter. You know, I've always told you before that my mother being redheaded, she was the perfect definition of a redhead. I mean, she could go from zero to 200, just, I mean, in the blink of an eye. I mean, she can be singing a gospel song, pulling into the driveway, and, and, and get out of the car, and everybody running. I mean, she, gets there, she got there quick. Well, let me tell you, I found myself to be her son later on in life. You know, very much her son that was given over to those same characteristics and those same traits and those same things that she had to wrestle with, that I had to wrestle with. And, and very much even when, when Amy and I first got married and I had to step back and realize that while I might have been raised along this line and kind of used to it, that I was terrifying my wife with these type characteristics and these traits and realized very quick and early on that there was an anger issue that was evolving and developing in my life. You know, and, and so, and let me tell you, I never... I never was asked 
do you want this anger issue? I was never asked that. Never. I was never asked, do you want this problem? Do you want this situation? Do you want this? Because my answer would have been immediately, no, I do not want it. But within the heart of every person, desires of the flesh are born. And, and lusts of the flesh are born. Within the heart of every individual. If it's individuals who are attracted to the same sex, or if it's heterosexuals that can't control themselves, whatever it might be, within the heart of everybody, evil is born. And this is what Paul declares, that one time we once conducted ourselves like this. There was a time when we once fulfilled all these desires of the flesh, all these lusts of the flesh. There was a time when we were given over to the passion and to everything that our flesh taught us was good, and it had a hold of us and it controlled us, but through the power of Christ and the power of God, things are different now. Things are different now. So when we talk about this, we don't talk about this issue alone. We talk about the, the real issue is taking our bad things and declaring them to be right. That, that, that's a bigger issue than anything else. It's taking our attitudes or taking our, you know, the, the wording or the things that we're pulled to or the things that we're drawn to and declaring them to be right because it's just something, it's just how we're made up. How many times have you heard people say, well, that's just the way I am. Well, you need to change if that's the way you are, right? I, that's just the way I am. I just, I tell it like it is. I, I put it out there and I just don't care who it hurts. Well, you need to get control of yourself if that's who you are. You need to reel yourself in a little bit. And if you haven't got the power to do it yourself, which you do not, then you need to find the power in Christ to reel yourself in a little bit. Because if we were all free to act on whatever desires we were born with, we would freely chase a dollar without giving any thought to who we might hurt along the way. We would give in to every angry impulse that comes our way just to fulfill the desires of the flesh. Because I'm guessing... While some faults and flaws are certainly picked up along life's journey, we all got stuff that we didn't want. And the fact that it being a choice to have it or not, in my opinion, is completely irrelevant. It's completely irrelevant. Because according to the Scripture, we all got something. Because we all once conducted ourselves along this line. Or we all once fulfilled these things within our life. Now, I want to go to Romans real quick, and I want you to listen to the way Paul talks about the immorality, the sexual immorality that's here. I want you to listen, because keep in mind, <laughs> like I said, it seems to be the tendency to say, if this is who I am, then this is how God made me, and it must be okay. From anything. Now, please, don't, don't take one item and put there from any item and from any issue. And we clearly know that's not the case because we all know God didn't do this to us, right? We all know that God didn't sit up there and decide what weakness am I going to pass on to Him and decide how He's going to handle it one day. I, God didn't make that decision. We made that decision by being disobedient children from a long time ago. We made that decision. And that the, the idea of original sin and the doctrine of original sin has been passed on from one generation to the next, to the next, to the next. So God didn't do it to us. We did it for ourselves. But the idea is, and listen, if this doesn't prove that, that the Genesis story is true, then I don't know what is. What, I, I don't know if you can find greater proof than to step back and look at the evil that is at work in everybody's life to one degree or another. To me, that is evidence that sinful traits and characteristics have been passed on to us from somebody throughout life. So what we're going to read here, listen to what he says in uh, Romans 1, 16 through 32. <clears throat> Let me read this here. Listen close to a couple of phrases in this as well. It says, for I, am not, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes. For the Jew first and also the Greek, for in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith as it is written. The just shall live by faith. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in righteousness. Now, there's two phrases in this I hope you heard. I hope you heard in verse 16 the phrase of the power of God, and in verse 18, the wrath of God. For Paul says this, starting off in this particular passage as he's speaking to the, to the church in Rome, he says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, because within the gospel of Christ is the power of God that's revealed in the life of the believer. 
The power of God that is revealed within me. And we're going to talk about that power and what he's, what he's mentioning. And then he goes on and he says, but the wrath of God is also revealed from heaven. The wrath of God is revealed, and he's going, to, he's going to talk about those, the Gentile people that God did not deal with during the Old Testament time, in the, in the sense that he dealt with with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And so we want to identify two things, the power of God and the wrath of God, because it may be very different than what you think. The wrath of God, Paul's not going to talk about as boils and pestilences that God passes down from heaven. He's not going to talk about it in the sense where earthquakes come and people die and there's tragedies and all these things. That is not the wrath of God that Paul defines here, nor is that the children of wrath that he defines just a few minutes ago that we talked about in Ephesians. The wrath of God here is very different than any of that stuff that you might think is coming when it comes to the Revelation story or the end time events and God just pouring out His judgment on top of another. I, let us decide, let us discuss here in a minute exactly what he's talking about when it comes to the wrath. So for Paul, first, the power of God is revealed to him through, through uh, the gospel story, which is Jesus Christ died on the cross, he rose again on the third day so that you and I can have everlasting life and so that we can be redeemed and we can be saved. The power of God is the power that works within the life of a believer that gives them power over these desires. And gives them power over the lust of the flesh. It's, the question is never going to be, what garbage was you born with? The question is always going to be, what do you choose in the midst of those desires? What do you do with it? What choices do you make when anger overtakes you? What choices do you make when disappointment just riddles your life and you've got to respond in one way or another? What choices do you make? When all of these things come crashing down from a homosexual standpoint or from a heterosexual standpoint, listen, I am a full-blown heterosexual male. It does not give me the right to go to the theater and watch Fifty Shades of Grey. Now that desire is there, right? Within, born within heterosexual men or women. It doesn't give me the right to do that. I've got choices to make. And for Paul says the power of God is the ability to overcome the desires of the flesh. The power of God is the ability to overcome the lust that the flesh have so that we don't have to be slaves to it. He sets us free and gives us power and He gives us authority over these things. So that's when he talks about the power of God. Listen to the way he describes the wrath of God. Go on to the next slide, if you will. The wrath of God, verse 19, it says... Because what, they, uh, because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, His invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even His eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because although they knew God, they did not glorify God as God, nor were thankful, uh, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Now listen to what he's saying. He's talking about people whom God didn't directly deal with. But Paul is saying this, that through God's creation, they have the same evidence that we all have to see that God is alive, that God created this, and God, that God did this. He said through the visible things that God created, we are able to see the invisible attributes of God. We're able to see the characteristics of God through the visible things that he created. And that's for everybody to see. Paul says he didn't hide this from anybody. He didn't hide it from the Gentiles. He didn't hide it from the, from the Jewish people. He didn't hide it from anybody. This is there for everybody to see. But what he's dealing with in Rome, it's not just the immorality that lives there, but it's the idea that the immorality is okay and they got it figured out. They've got it figured out. Everybody else's stance on this is bad, you shouldn't be doing it. Well, they're enlightened to the point to where... They understand what this stuff is. And to the point to where Paul is going to say here that they've become their own gods. Listen to the next passage. The next passage in Romans 1 20 says, Professing to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image like corruptible man and birds and four-footed animals of creeping things. Therefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness and the lust of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves. Now, I want you to listen Verse 22, it says, Professors to be wise, they became flues, and they changed the glory of the incorruptible God into a corruptible God. They become the object of their own desire. They become the object of their own worship. They stopped worshiping the Creator, and they started worshiping the creation. And when that step is made, 
when the creation becomes the object of worship, then we're, we're led to the place of where whatever desires we have must be good. Unless society condemns them. But if we really want them, we work hard enough, maybe we can change society's mind. Because the desires within us must be good. When the object of worship becomes the corruptible, and Paul said that they began worshiping the corruptible God, not the incorruptible God, not the God that's above measure, not the God that created everything, not the holy and righteous God, but they, become, they began to worship creation. And listen to what he says in verse 24, that God also gave them up to uncleanness. That's the wrath of God that Paul talks about. He gave them up to uncleanness. The wrath of God, like I said, is not bowls and pestilences that God deals out on humanity. The wrath of God is when God decides to stop rescuing humanity from humanity. That's wrath. When God decides to take a step back and give you what you want, that's the wrath of God. The wrath of God is when God decides to no longer intervene and interfere with your life. When He turns you over to the desires and the lust of your flesh that, live with, that lives within you. Because you are, you can't control it. You can't control it. And when God decides to take a step back and let you deal with that and let you have exactly what you want, we're going to, he's going to read what we end up with. He's going to tell us here in a minute what we end up with. But that's the wrath that he's talking about, that God decided that he turned them over to themselves. He turned them over. He turned them loose. The wrath of God, he didn't stand up in heaven and decide to, 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 to dole out punishment upon them. He just stopped rescuing them at that time. He stepped back. And when he stepped back, he turned them over to their own lust and to their own desires. That, that, that's wrath. You know, hell has often been described as a place where God is not. But whatever... Listen, the wrath of God is when God decides to stop saving you from yourself. And he turns you over to yourself. Because according to the way Paul writes in the New Testament and my own example in my life, you're helpless at that point. And you can't control the urges and the sinful desires that rage within. And while you may be able to point at certain things and say, well, I would never do that, or I don't want to do that, or I don't want to do that, you may not do that, but there are some things you will do. There are some things you will do. Whatever that is that you won't do or that you will do, at the very least, you will never be able to declare yourself to be righteous before God, to say the least. But the bulk of it is, the power of God is the power that, lives, that Christ gives us to overcome the sinfulness that is within us. The wrath of God is when God steps back and turns you over to your own mind. Listen, I don't know how He makes us righteous enough to come into His presence. I don't know. That is true power. If there's ever power, that's got to be the greatest power. Because within the hearts and within the minds of all of us lives evil things and bad things. And the last thing any of us need is for God to step back and give you over to your own desires. And when that happens, you're hopeless at that particular point. Listen to what he says as he goes on. Verse 25. Now listen to the way he explains it. Here's what happens. When they're turned over to their own desires, here's what happens. To exchange the truth of God for the lie, they worshiped and served the creature rather than the Creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, God gave them up to vile passions. God didn't put these passions within them. He didn't... Uh, create these passions within them. They were born out of their own desires, out of their own hearts, and he steps back and he gives them over to their own passions. For even their women exchanged the natural use for what is against nature. Likewise, also the men, leaving the natural use of, one, of the woman, burned in their lust for one another, men with men, committing what is shameful and receiving in themselves the penalty of their error which was due. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind to do things which are not fitting. God turned them loose to do, to fulfill the passions that were born in their own minds and in their own hearts. And he starts here, and like I said, living, uh, dealing with that particular culture, 
is probably not very different from the culture we're dealing with today in the sense of worshiping the creature and uh, understanding what's righteous and what's unrighteous. Go on to the next one, if you will. Listen to what he says. Being filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil-mindedness, they are whispers, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful, who know in the righteousness judgment, the righteous judgment of God, that those who practice such things are deserving of death. Not only do they uh, do the same, but also approve of those who practice them. Now, let me say one more time. There may be many of those that you could point at and say, well, I'd never do that, but you cannot point at all of them and say, I'd never do that, or I haven't done that. I'm certain, because isn't it interesting that while we're not going to dive into the details of the sexual immorality that's there, he just classifies it as sexual immorality. Be it from a heterosexual standpoint or from a homosexual standpoint, uh, the, the sexual immorality that's there, nor are we going to dive into the backbiters and talk about everything that classifies as backbiters or disobedient to parents. Have we got to really talk about the difference in the disobedience from parents from a 12-year-old and a 45-year-old? and disobedience or dishonoring our parents, all of it is, is categorized in there together because Paul knows as well as anybody that within the hearts of men, this evil is born. This evil is born. And, and, and there again, if you have some of these, and I'm certain you do, I'm guessing there was a time in your life that you were not, or, or there wasn't a time in your life where God showed up at your doorstep and asked with a list in hand and said, all right, take a pick. Which do you want? Which do you want? Do you want sexual cravings you can't contain? Or, or, or do you want the need to feel important so you gossip and you tell everybody every news you got? Well, which do you want? Do you want to be rebellious to your parents? Or do you want to be the person that stabs other people in the back all the time? You got a preference? You didn't choose it. And the fact that you, doesn't, you didn't choose it does not validate a reason to go do it. Whatever it is. So outside of Christ and outside of the power of God, you're doomed to your own lust and your own desires of the flesh. And the worst thing God could ever do for any of us, any of us, is to step back and let you have what you want. That's the worst thing He could ever do. We ought to be running to church on Sunday morning to give Him thanks that He didn't step back and give us what we wanted. We ought to hit our knees every night and give Him thanks and give Him praise for the power that He has to make people like me and you powerful over our own fleshy desires and at the same time righteous before our Heavenly Father. That He didn't step back and turn us loose. So He classifies all these things and many other things. And I'm guessing this is not a complete list. This is just an example of certain sins and certain disobedient things or unrighteous things that were going on during the day. Let us, let us never declare that because we have it, it must be okay. And regardless of how bad you want it, it still doesn't make it okay. Go on to the next one. We're going to conclude here in Ephesians 2, 4 through 10. Listen to what it says. But God, who is rich in mercy, because of His great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that the ages to come He might show the exceeding riches of His grace and His, and His kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourself, it is the gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. Now listen to 10. For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. It's amazing to think the transition that takes place from the person that Paul talks about in Romans, about people that have all of these things going on within our hearts, within our lives, and with our own desires, and with our own fleshes, to a person of which God creates for good. A person that Christ has created, or created in Christ Jesus, for good works which God's prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Paul doesn't make this explanation before we know Christ, he only talks about this after we come to know Christ. It's when Christ enters our life does He give us power over things. Let me tell you the problem I think we've got more than anything else. While people will say they're not perfect, 
many think they really are. That's the problem we've got more. The problem we've got is not so much that they will tell you God does these great things in their life, but I don't know if they're convinced that bad really lurks within. That's the problem more than anything else. While they say it with their mouth, I'm not fully convinced. You know, the Bible talks about they, they proclaim with their mouth that they love me, but their heart is far from me. There are certain proclamations that they make about what God can do and what God will do and what God has done, but I don't know if they're really convinced they fully need God to have power over their own self. But within all of us, I'm telling you, and I hope as an adult that you've got enough insight in your own life to know that you don't have power over a lot of those things that rage in your life. Outside of Christ, you are powerless to those things. As a matter of fact, I don't think the Bible even teaches us that desires of the flesh go away until the flesh goes away. I don't think, I don't think the desires that this flesh, or the things that this flesh wants, that it claims that it needs, or that it's passionate about, I think as long as you're a part of it, you're always going to have to wrestle that stuff. And the only way you can declare to have victory in that is through the power of Christ. As a matter of fact, Galatians uh, says, gives us this scripture. Listen to this, 5 and 16. I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. He doesn't say walk in the Spirit, and the lust of the flesh will go away. He says walk in the Spirit, and you will have enough power to not fulfill the lust of the flesh. That's what Paul says. At one time, I, like you, was given over to all of it, and I conducted my life, and I fulfilled these desires. But through the power of Christ, we now have power to walk in this world without fulfilling the desires and the lust of the flesh. So that's why I say, when this issue is talked about in the Bible, it's categorized within the problem of humanity, period. Period. It, it's categorized within the problems of all of it and everything that's there. And that none of that should ever be declared right. None of that should ever be declared good. None of it. For, for, regardless of what the intent is and how harmless it may appear to be, it should never be categorized as good or as right, or something, certainly not something, that's worth celebrating. So I don't, wh wh whatever issue you've got in your life, I would, I would, if you told me that you were born with it, I would almost probably agree with you. Yep, I got some too. That's not the question, nor is that the issue. The issue is, do you have power over it today? That's the issue. Have you accepted Christ, and have you found Christ to be the only one that can give you power over this stuff you wrestle with. Let me say this. <clears throat> Heterosexual men are attracted to women. Men, would you all agree to that? Come on, don't, I mean, good grief. I'm not splitting the atom here. You know what I mean? Isn't a great revelation from the depths of my soul? I would hope you would agree with that. They're attracted to women. And, and, and not to be disappointing, the women, not woman, women. That has to be contained as well. From a female standpoint, that has to be Contained. My wife is attracted to men. She was born that way, I suppose. And she has to make sure that her attraction and her affection is towards me. And outside of the power of Christ, it's going to be tough. It's going to be tough. But from a heterosexual standpoint or from a homosexual standpoint, regardless of what you might decide you've been born with, it takes the power of Christ to live righteous lives and to overcome the evil that lurks within our hearts and within our souls. So what many would like to debate today about this issue, is it right or wrong? Today I've taken the standpoint that it's just given 
that it's wrong since it's categorized with everything else that would, that would declare itself to be wrong and unrighteous in the sight of God. Today, more than anything else, what I want to get across is you cannot act on sinful impulses in your life. I don't, I don't, like I said, I don't care if it's, you just like to tell it like it is. Well, pull that back a little bit. And, and you need to have better judgment on when you decide to tell it like it is and to who you want to tell it like it is too. Because you may be hurting folks. Two, sleeping with this one or that one or that one. Got to be reeled in. And through the power, you can't do it. The worst thing God could ever do to you is step back and say, you want these things? Go get them. Go get them. And there's nothing but destruction ahead of you. So the wrath of God is not God sitting up in heaven at this particular stage of humanity and pouring out pestilences on us. The wrath of God is us stepping back and giving us exactly what we want in life. And we're doomed at that point. We're doomed. So the power of God is to overcome. The wrath of God is to sit in our own field. and can't get out of it to save our life. This morning we're going to pray. Heath, if you want to come back around. <clears throat> we're going to take some time and we're going to pray this morning. And let me tell you, you know, what these prayers are to look like and sound like and be like, I think it's going to be different for everybody to some degree or another because I'm convinced that there's nobody here that can tell me that after I come to know Christ, all the desires of the flesh faded away. Absolutely not. My daddy can tell you today, he said it many times. He, he quit drinking and give his heart to Christ and he went through drinking and he went through drugs and he went through this, that, and the other. There are times that I, he would he'd say one of two things. I could drink a beer this tall. Or I can smoke a cigarette like this. And it's been 30 years since he's dabbled in it. Those desires keep knocking on the door. They keep knocking. And the power of Christ gives us authority over such desires. And like I said, now we've, while we can categorize those big ones or whatever you want to call them, there's also the desires to put people down and run people down and backbiters and even, he said, whispers, deceitful, dishonest. All of these sinful passions have to be fought through the power of Christ. Stand your feet this morning. If we do nothing else this morning, let us at least acknowledge the fact that we need Christ to overcome the stuff that works within us. Let us at least acknowledge, bit at the altar or where we stand or whatever it is, let us at least take time to acknowledge this morning that without Jesus I'm powerless in the things that have me. And while I might be able to beat back one, there's another one going to take its place. And while I might be able to handle it, something else is going to take its place. So we're going to have a word of prayer. Then we're going to invite you to pray. You can pray where you're at. You can come to the altar. Whatever you want to do this morning. So if you bow your head, let me have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, for this time together. I thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to gather together and to worship, to serve, <clears throat> to read your word and uh, to celebrate. Father, we know that there's a lot of things that's going on in our culture today that is... Uh, that's not pleasing to you. Father, we also know that there's a lot of things that works within us that's not pleasing to you. And Father, I pray that none of us ever think that we've got it under control. But God, I pray that we lean on your power and we lean on your authority that enables us to overcome these things that work within us. Whatever it might be. From the things that go on in our life privately to the things that go on in our life publicly. Father, we thank you that we do have power in Jesus and we thank you more than anything that you didn't give up on us, that you didn't step away from us, but you pursued us to rescue us from ourselves. And Father, we thank you for that. We thank you for making us alive, setting us free from the bondage of sin. And Lord, I pray today that, that we take this opportunity and we take this time just to give you thanks for that. In Christ's name, amen. As Heath sings, I invite you to come pray, or you can pray where you're at, whatever it is you want to, however you want to respond.